no one had ever spoken about internment operations in Kingston. I went to a very good high school, Regiopolis, Notre Dame. I went to Queen's University. Obviously, this is where this all begins. I'm doing my MA. No one who taught me had ever mentioned this. So I began digging into it after Mr. Sakayuk spoke to me, and I found a few, very few references to so-called Austrians, Germans, and Turks being interned in Canada during the First World War. And that's the way it was always described. Austrians, Germans, and Turks. But Mr. Sakaluk was from Bukovina and was a Ukrainian and very clearly said he was a Ukrainian. So why were Ukrainians not being included? And I remember thinking about that, but that wasn't really the main thrust of my MA. I was doing historical geography, Ukrainians in Kingston. So I wrote a book. It was published eventually by Limestone Press by Richard Pierce called Ukrainians in the Making, Their Kingston Story. I included in that uh, an, a transcript of the interview with Mr. Sekulyuk. Um, Brian Rolison, who was another professor at the Royal Military College, uh, took that interview and we fleshed it out and we published it as the first little booklet that was written about internment called Internment Operations, The Role of Old Fort Henry in World War I. And you can see that. That came out in 1980. So as far as I know, this is the first publication that was circulated to libraries around the country. It has an ISBN and all that kind of stuff about the internment operations and talks about Sakaluk's story. Uh, Boldan Kordan and I wrote an opinion editorial that was published in the Globe and Mail uh, called And Who Says Time Heals All, which introduced the subject to the broader Canadian public. And Richard Pierce, who I've mentioned before, he helped uh, promote the notion of oral histories, published through the Limestone Press this little booklet called The Time for Atonement, 1988. This was the first more general booklet, a lot of photographs and so on, that went out across the country to inform people about the internment operations. And it was in effect sanctioned by John Grigorovich, who then later became the chairman of something called the Ukrainian Canadian Civil Liberties Association, which is with us to this day. And UCLA, as we call it, and our foundation, the Ukrainian Canadian Civil Liberties Foundation, became the organizations that spearheaded the campaign for some kind of what we used to call acknowledgement or recognition and symbolic redress. Now, there were very few survivors left by that time already, because you imagine this is you know, almost 80 years after the fact when we start raising the subject, the survivors were dying off. Uh, no one had ever bothered to interview most of them. So they mostly went to their graves, afraid to speak about it, or felt it wasn't of any interest, or just got on with their lives and decided not to talk about it. But one of the people we did meet came out of the woodwork, as it were, in 1988, after Bodan Kordan and I wrote that piece in the Globe and Mail, and who says time heals all. I got a call uh, from Toronto, and a man there who was a member of the Ukrainian National Federation, UNO, said to me, you know, we have this lady in Hamilton, Mary Manko Haskett, who says she'd like to talk to you. She saw your op-ed in the Globe and Mail. And so eventually I drove down to see Mary Manko. I went with Alexandra Hitchi, Lasha Hitchi, who's now the president of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. Um, and we interviewed Mary Manko. And it turned out that Mary Manko was a Montreal born girl. So she's a Canadian born and raised in Montreal, a Ukrainian family. The entire family is rounded up during Canada's first national internment operations and transported into the Abitibi region in northwestern northwest central Quebec, essentially into the boreal forest, where these Ukrainians and a few others uh, internees were forced to basically carve their camp out of the wilderness and build an experimental farm. Now, Mary Manka was six years old when she was interned. Six years old. What threat did she represent? And she went up to this camp with her family and watched her sister Nellie die there. We still don't know where Nellie is buried for sure. Okay, so Mary is telling us this story, and it's a powerful story, as you, can, as you can hear. And I remember talking to Mary about redress and saying, well, you know, you've probably been reading that, you know, the Japanese Canadian community, individual compensation, official apology, and so on, which is what they got. Do you want compensation? Do you want some kind of apology? And you know what? I will always honor her memory, and I do. I pray for her regularly. Um, she said, you know, Lubmer, if you're going to start this campaign, your campaign should be about memory, not money. She didn't want a nickel. 
the campaign in the sense of articulating to the government of Canada that we uh, feel there should be some kind of official recognition or acknowledgement, as we used to call it, and some kind of symbolic redress. And all the elements of that begin in the sort of mid-1980s and continue through until 2008, when the government of Canada, in the person of Jason Kenney, in Toronto at the Stanley Barracks, which was a receiving station for internees, finally signed the settlement that resolved this matter based on Inky Marks Bill C-331. When we began the campaign, the first thing I noticed was there's nothing about it in the public domain. You know, there's the booklets we're putting out and the articles and so on. In the public arena, I said, we've got to start commemorating the places where these internees were. And there were 24 camps and receiving stations right across the country. So there were permanent camps and there were receiving stations where people were gathered together before they were reshipped somewhere else. And so when Mary Monka told me, make it about memory, not money, I said, okay, John Gregorovich, how do we do this? And we decided, let's start putting up historical markers. Let's take the standard historical marker that you see everywhere that the Canadian government puts up or that provincial governments put up, sometimes municipal governments, and let's replicate it. Let's have bronze markers. They must always, we said, be trilingual, English, French, and Ukrainian. And let's start placing them at every internment camp site. And I must say that with my friends in UCLA and with some support eventually from the Ukrainian Canadian Foundation of Taras Shevchenko, um, we have put up historical markers at all of the internment camp sites, with the exception of Halifax and Citadel. We have, um, on the 100th anniversary of the War Measures Act, we unveiled 100, in fact, 100 plus uh, bronze plaques, bilingual plaques, right across the country from uh, uh, Amherst, Nova Scotia to Nanaimo, BC, a kind of wave. We did it at 11 o'clock local time. So it just started with a wave of unveilings right across the country. We also decided to put up statues. And uh, we were very fortunate to find a very talented, very unique man in the person of uh, John Boxtel, a Dutch Canadian. Uh, came here after the Second World War as a young boy, very grateful to Canada for the role Canadians played in liberating Holland. John Boxdale is a great sculptor. He became a friend of mine for many years. And John uh, crafted, uh, shaped several internee statues. So John, uh, essentially out of a commitment to this cause, remember, he's Dutch-Canadian. But he got it. He understood the meaning of the internment operations for the Ukrainian community. And so he made these more than life-size statues, which are now in several places across Canada. We couldn't have done this if it hadn't been some great people. Uh, Metislav and Nuba Turtiak in Toronto own MST Browns. And without their support, uh, MST Browns making the plaques for us, we wouldn't have been able to get it done. The Shevchenko Foundation contributed uh, grants to some of those plaques as well. You know, a, 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 an initiative, a campaign that began with some research in the late 70s, led to the Civil Liberties Commission and then eventually UCLA taking up the cudgels by the mid 80s. By 2000, you had the uh, engagement of other community organizations. 2008, you got the settlement. And now for the last 10, 11 years, we've had the Endowment Council funding commemorative and educational projects right across the country and including the other affected communities because we, we saw, saw that as being important. So we've had now, if, you, if you're interested in these things, you can literally travel from coast to coast and find plaques, historical markers. Even more importantly from my point of view, because I'm more kind of museum guy than I am a, a media guy. Um, I wanted something to be in the Canadian Museum of History. And I'm delighted that the Endowment Council provided resources to Sarah Bellew, who's now Dr. Sarah Bellew at Simon Fraser University to do an archeological study of the Morrissey internment camp. And as Sarah was doing her research, which we certainly encouraged, what does she discover but artifacts from the internment camp at Morrissey, including shovels that were used in digging the escape tunnel and even a small cross 
probably worn around a, 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 the neck on a chain, a little crucifix-like object made out of barbed wire. I mean, how powerful is that? Those artifacts, real things from that time, speak to who these men were. People who wanted to get out of there. They wanted to dig a tunnel to get out. They almost made it. A major new exhibit on the War Measures Act. It was supposed to be uh, unveiled on 30th September 2020, but obviously with the current public health emergency, that's not going to happen. But there will be a major exhibit on the use of the War Measures Act and its impact on civil liberties and human rights in times of domestic and international crisis. Canada's first national German operations, World War II and the impact on Japanese, German, Italian, and other Canadians in that period, and the Quebec crisis in 1970. The story really is, what does this tell us about the nature of Canada? You're invited to come here. We need you. Well, we don't really like your type. You know, you're not even white, they used to say about Ukrainians. Um, but we need you. So we're going to use you to settle the prairies, develop the prairies. We need you in the timber camps and the mines and so on. So we'll use you as labor. Oh, we're at war now. Well, of course, we're British. Not Canadian, we're British. And Britain's at, at war with the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Germany and the Ottoman Empire. Hey, your passport says you're an Austro-Hungarian. And you say, no, 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 I'm a Ukrainian. I don't, you know, nothing sympathetic. I'm not sympathetic with the Austro-Hungarian. It doesn't matter. You're an enemy alien overnight. Some of your friends, if not you, are rounded up and carted off. God knows where. You lose touch. Uh, families are broken up. There is essentially a repression. And this continues. And this was legal by the War Measures Act. 